Good day. Welcome to Fresh Manna Ministries, hosted by Reverend Dr. Alan G. Jenkins, Jr., and yours truly, Benjamina Jenkins, and a host of pastors, evangelists, teachers, ministers, prayer warriors, and partners. Together, we are on a mission to encourage, equip, and strengthen the body of Christ and to win lost souls for the kingdom of heaven. And those of us who live in the areas out where the trees are blossoming and things, and those of us who are in the city areas, uh, we get a glimpse of how God moves and how God does what God does. And I'm looking out the back window right now, and here I'm looking and seeing the oranges and the yellows and uh, all of the colors, the greens and the, the mixture of the colors. Uh, you remember going to school, and I remember uh, one of the projects that we had was to go and find some leaves and bring them back. I'm talking elementary school here now, and bring them back and just reflect on those things and imagine uh, the goodness of, of creation, and we say the goodness of God. Well, we've got to be able to expect a miracle. You've got to be able to expect a miracle. If you're not able to expect a miracle, then you're not going to get a miracle. So it's your ability. God gives us the ability, but it's you who have to activate that ability for God to do miraculous things. So you've got to expect a miracle. Well, the scriptures that were read into your hearing this morning was God doing some miraculous things for the children of Israel. What do you say, Pastor Jenkins? Well, because of their unbelief, remember now, because of their unbelief, Israel was sentenced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Those years have now expired, and the children of Israel are poised to enter into Canaan land. They are ready to claim their inheritance in the land of promise. However, before they can enter Canaan, they must get past one final major obstacle. What was that obstacle? The Jordan River. And I ask you, what may your obstacle be? Obstacles. What may they be? Normally, this would have presented uh, much of a problem. Uh, because the river now is overflowing. Since the Jordan was only 100 feet wide at Gilgal, uh, where they crossed, well, it seems that God always does things in a way that no one can boast of having done them on their own. Somebody here with me? Uh, God will do it. You can ask God, and you have uh, expectation that God is going to do it one way, and God does it a a whole nother way based on how you wanted it to go. Well, the Jordan River now is overflowing. This crossing would have been no exception for the children of Israel. You see, God brought them to the Jordan River at the time of harvest, and that was uh, read in uh, chapter 4, verse 15. Those who have been there uh, during the harvest time tell us that the Jordan swells to, to an impassable width of over one mile, one mile wide. It was over 50 times wider than it normally would have been when Israel arrived because of the time of the year. Now, I've been at the Jordan River uh, a couple of times, and I, and it's, it's not a big thing. It's not a big place. But at this time of the year, as the scriptures tell us, it is overflowing. There was no way they could cross this river on their own. They needed what? Supernatural help. Is somebody listening to me this morning? Sometimes we need supernatural help. My friends, we each have Jordans that we face from time to time. When we look at the obstacles and, uh, that, that stand between us and, and spiritual victory in our own Canaan, uh, we may feel that we will never be able to enter our Canaan of victory and enjoy the abundant life that Jesus promised his followers. Well, 
It is true that I don't know what kind of obstacles uh, that you uh, may face in your life, but I do know a God who specializes in overcoming the overwhelming and in leading his children to victory, crossing uh, the Jordan. What's the title of the message? Obstacles. Crossing your Jordan. There will be obstacles, and God is able to do a miracle. This morning, I would like for us to look into this account of Israel as they, they, they got past their Jordan after some movement, after some things, after some instruction, after yielding themselves over to God. Yes, the Jordan is there, and yes, we are able to cross, but there are some specific things that we have to do in order to get over. Oh, how I got over. As as we do, uh, look at these things this morning, I'd like to offer you some hope, 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 hope. I, you, you need some hope. You see, the things that worked for them over 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, years ago, they still work for you and I today. Allow me to show you from chapters 3 and and chapters 4 of Joshua how to get past your Jordan. There are three steps that I want to start with that we must take uh, as a guarantee that we will be able to get past whatever that obstacle is and whatever blocks us and whatever is in our way. May it be physical, emotional, psychological, I don't know what yours is. I know what mine is, and everybody's got something. I don't care what it is, something that's blocking you from the blessing of your Jordan. Maybe a big thing, maybe a little thing. To me, your thing may be a little thing. To you, my thing may be a little thing. But to me, it can be a big thing, and your thing can be a big thing to you. But this morning, we're going to examine how to get past the opposite. Obstacles. Let me share some of these things with you this morning. Number one, number one, we need to examine the message. Examine the message. You say, what message? God took the children of Israel out and said, this is what I want you to do. And what is our message? You got to get in your book. You got to get in your Bible. You got to get from Genesis to Revelation. You may not read it word for word, back and forth, uh, 100% cover to cover all in one sitting. I did that. And it took quite a bit of time to move from Genesis to Revelation without stopping and wanting wondering and picking apart and uh, having yourself try to ask question after question after question. Sometimes you need to grab your Bible. And sometimes you need to read it like it's a novel. I don't know. And some of us, some of us haven't read a book cover to cover uh, since we we had a little three page coloring book uh, in elementary school. But I'm saying to you, you've got to read your Bible and just read your Bible. Sometimes reading your Bible without questioning your Bible, uh, because the enemy will get in your head. And you know how we are. We are questionable people. We like to question. We want to know why. But I tell you this. Here's a word from Pastor Jenkins. Read read your Bible and read it straight through for its content, not for its historical events, not for what you deem to be spiritual, not for what you you deem to be what is the gospel and what isn't the gospel, what is prophecy, what isn't prophecy. Read it just to read it. Indulge yourself. A, it involved a challenge. It involved a challenge. Reading your Bible, the message, God gave them a message. It involves a challenge. When it came time for the people to move forward, to cross the Jordan, God has a message that they needed to hear. In the words they heard, they were challenged to do, here we go, three very important things. Now, listen to me clearly. These things were designed to help them follow the Lord in a better way, in a better way. These are the same things that we need to hear this morning that will help us to follow the Lord step by step as we move on into our lives. What do you say, Pastor Jenkins? Well, watch this. Number one. 
He told them to watch, watch. We've got to watch God. If you notice that the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned seven times in this chapter, seven times in this chapter, the Ark, you may remember, uh, was the special piece of tabernacle furniture that symbolized the presence and power of God. When the ark was in the Holy of Holies, the glory of God rested upon it, and it was the dwelling place of God, the ark of the covenant. He said, follow the ark, follow the covenant of of God. When the ark was there, God rested with the people. To Israel, it, it represented God's presence in the midst of his people. In other words, When God moved, they were to move. When God stopped, they were to do the same. Full stop, sisters and brothers. Sometimes you go overboard. Stop. When the covenant says stop, stop. When the ark says stop, when God says stop, when you start worrying and you get overwhelmed, that is God saying stop, stop. There's a valuable spiritual lesson in this passage. You say, what passage is that? That that is uh, chapter 1, chapter uh, 3, verse 1. Well, let me be clear about that so we can make sure. That's chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. That's where the examination of God's message comes in. I want to be clear with you. How about following God? Number two, when they saw the ark of the covenant move, they were to leave their place and go after, go after the ark. They had to go after it. Not only were they to watch God, they were to move when God moved, when the ark moved. They were to pursue God. Don't get too deep on me right now. Well, how did that happen? Or who told them to move? God instructs, God instructs men and women even today. If you don't realize that this is an instruction for you right now, you need to go back to page one, chapter one in the book, read the credits in the book, read the forward, and then you can get on board with what I'm talking about. I'm talking to each and every one of us this morning. God is speaking to your heart. Leave your place and go after it, after the ark, after God. They were to watch God. They were to move when God said move. They were to pursue God. Again, the lesson for the believer is that it isn't enough to know what God is doing. There comes a time when you must leave your place and go after him. You ain't got to sit there with your prayer partner, with your people, with the, the, the leadership of the church, the organization. You ain't got to go through none of that when God says, hey, I ain't talking physical. I ain't talking that you got to get up and move and uh, go around the corner to the uh, open door church of, of here we are now. I'm saying you've got to leave a place where you have become so stagnant that you don't see God in your spirit, in your heart, in your mind. This may require us to leave our comfort zone. Israel was about to follow the ark through the river that was over one mile wide. Stay with me. That couldn't have been easy because you've got over a million people. It, was, it, was a, it, was, it wasn't like uh, uh, two, three hundred folk that left out of uh, uh, Egypt, my sisters and brothers. It was thousands of folk when God said, let my people go. You know how we say, let my peoples go. And when they came out of uh, Egypt, they came out in numbers. And then traveling 40 years in the wilderness, some of them peeled off. The unbelievers died in the wilderness, and God only left those who were believers to get to the river's edge, Jordan. Remember the 12 spies, those who denied, they weren't able to get in. Joshua and Caleb, they saw it, they reported it, they were able, they were able, but, but, but it, it was still necessary. And with God, it was, it was the right thing. Follow God. 
Sisters and brothers, following God may not be the easiest thing you will ever do, but it will be the best thing uh, you will ever do. If you expect to get past your obstacles and enter into your Canaan, talk about a promised land or getting over that thing, you must learn to follow God. Number three, you got to honor God. Remember what she read, what Benjamin read this morning. It said, Honor God. Notice the Israelites were told to stay at least 3,000 feet behind the arks. Stay, stay back. Stay back. This was so that they could easily, what? See what was happening ahead of them. If you get all up in it and get all mixed all in it, then, then you can't see what God is doing. Stand back. Let God be God. Let God be God. Another reason is that the Lord wanted no one but the Israelites near the ark. The, 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 the Israelite Levites, God wanted a particular people near the ark carrying the ark and i submit to you this morning that if you hear if you can hear the sound of my voice we are of the levitical priesthood you're just not a somebody the ones that god calls out as the sister said a couple of weeks ago uh, choosing many are called but few are chosen the levites were chosen I'm a Levite. You're a Levite. Hear me clearly. To get too close would have meant death. God will not let folk that are not his get close. It will cause a whole tremendous breakdown. You and I, we get close. I get close. We're in the same camp. Again, there's a lesson for us right here. We must never be guilty of treating God. Somebody listen to what I'm saying right here. You must never be guilty of treating God like he is one of our buddies, one of our girls, sister girl, brother man. No, God is God. And when you get to treating God as a buddy, then you leave and lose the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the ministries out there. Look at some of the great ministers that were, were, were spiritually led, and all of a sudden, I, I, I'm a little God. God is my buddy. I'm like, I'm like God. You can be like God. Remember, the scripture says, you are gods. Come on now. Don't be guilty of treating God like he's one of your buddies. There must always be a holy reverence and a fear of the Lord in our hearts. God help us that we never allow a spirit of familiarity to cheapen our walk with the Lord, regardless of what we go through with a holy, righteous God, and we are still nothing but those who were sinners saved by his grace. The bottom line is who, who, who is who? You or you, and God is God. Uh, wait a minute now. You wouldn't let the kids, you wouldn't let the children uh, run your house, would you? You leave out of there and the place be all upside down because they have no discipline. God is not going to let us run his creation. All you got to do is look around right now, coast to coast, north, south, east, and west. The children have been running the house. And there are some who will proclaim that America, 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 God shed his grace on thee. And uh, you know the song. I'm not going to go through the song. But guess what? God shed his grace. Humanity, men and women and deceitfulness and the devil and his demons and his minions are running the house. And what happens? Take a look around. It ain't about race. It ain't about religion. It ain't, it's about turning away from God. Simply put, those three things I just, uh, 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 I just uh, mentioned to you, they, they easily accomplish, accomplish uh, the work that I, I need to be set out to do right now. I actually, you know, Pastor Jing, I, I could stop right about there and let you uh, uh, marinate in them three points. Watch God. Is that right? Watch God. What, what, what was number two? Come on now. Uh, be involved with God. You say, well, you honor God. Is that right? 
Honor God. Watch God. Follow God. Honor God. Y'all, I, but I got a little bit more. Y'all got a little, y'all ready? I'm, 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 I got warmed up. Uh, I, this is a message that I pulled out of my window up in the pulpit. Uh, the designated speaker uh, was not able to make it this morning, so I went over to that window up in the in, in the pulpit area, opened it up, and pulled out one of my messages. And here we are, and I'm feeling good about it. It may not always be easy, but I can promise you that if you will follow, he will certainly lead. Let's just right here. It involved the command. Next, the people were told to sanctify themselves. This referred to being uh, sure that they were as clean and holy as they could possibly be. All of us are like filthy rags. God knows that. You know that. And I know that. But you still got to take a shower. And that means to submerge yourself in the word of God. Give yourself to the work of God. Be as clean as you possibly can. And God will do the rest. They were to put away anything that was displeasing to the Lord. They were to examine themselves and get ready uh, for the Lord to do something great for them. Y'all stay with me. If you and I... Uh, ever expect to get past the Jordans that arise in our lives, we are going to have to learn that one of the first things we must do is examine our lives to make sure they are as clean as we possibly can get them. And they ain't going to get all that clean, yo. It's not going to happen. But We've got to examine ourselves. May the Lord help us to realize that many of the things that happen in our lives that prevent us from walking in, in, in victory are the result of our sin and, and the Lord's chastisement. You can find that in Galatians 6, 9 and Hebrews 12, uh, 6 through 11. Uh, sisters and brothers, um, uh, everything in your life uh, would be be uh, most pleasing to the Lord if we considered who we are and who He is. I, uh, I was in a, a service the other day, and I tell you, I felt I felt I fell short because I, I made a statement that I knew. You know, Pastor Jenkins always rolls with some controversy. That I, he wouldn't be him if he didn't drop some controversy in the air. And uh, one of the things I said, well, Jesus was not a Christian. You go, oh, well, let me give a little clarification. Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus did not come to build uh, a religion. Uh, Jesus did not come to set up Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Protestants, Catholics, uh, holiness, uh, apostolics. Jesus didn't come to set none of that mess up. Jesus came to give the good news of God who has come to humanity to develop a relationship, renew a relationship that was lost to Adam and Eve. You say, what's the part that makes you upset, Pastor Jenkins? The part that made me upset, I said all that, but I never said who he is. And I'm telling you right now, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and the morning star. He is the great I am. He is who he is, always is, always will be, and will never cease to be. That's who he is. He is the great I am. Oh, come on now. I didn't get a chance to say that, so I just had to say it this morning. Amen. Oh, what did it involve? What did it involve? It involved a commitment. Uh, the message to the Israelites uh, uh, was to remind them that uh, getting across the Jordan did not rest on their on their shoulders, but on the Lord's. You hear what I'm saying? It was on the Lord. It was His plan to get them over, and it was His problem. Oh, come on now. I said, giving the house to the kids, you leave the house to the kids, they're going to tear it up. But it's your problem if you left them, and it's your problem to straighten it out. And God knows what we need. Now, I don't know if I, I'll take that word problem back. It's his concern for his creation. 
okay? In, in the verses that we talk about, he makes them a promise and tells them uh, that he will bring them through in the power and in, in the power of his might. God commits himself to bring his people across the Jordan. He's committed to take you past your Jordans. He's committed. All that was required of Israel was that they trust God. Somebody can hear me. Somebody out there, you hearing me? Uh, amen. May I remind you, my sisters and my brothers, that things have not changed one single solitary bit. God, if he could do it, okay, if he could be trusted in those days to keep his promises, then he can still be trusted today. We often are, are unable to get past the obstacles in our lives because uh, we live a life that uh, exhibits a deep lack of faith in the promises of God. Some of us got to go. You want to go up higher? Then you got to go up higher in the Lord. You want to go up higher? Then you got to go up higher in the Lord. You can't hang down there in the mud and expect to go up higher in the Lord, begging and crying and weeping and whining and travailing. But you want to go up higher? No. You want to go up higher? Then you got to go up higher. You want to go up higher? You got to go up higher. How do I get up higher? You got to trust in the Lord. You got to have Faith the size of a mustard seed. How do I know? Because of the worry and doubt that makes the lives of the people of God miserable at times. What is it? Oh, here we go. We worry over tomorrow. Yet the Lord uh, has said, don't worry. I know everything that's going on in your life. We worry over material things. And the Lord says, don't worry. I got you food on your table. I got the roof over your head. Might be shaking. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you messed up. You need to take them credit cards. You need to cut them. What you need to do is park that car sometime because you're running out of gas and your money, you got more, more months than you got money. You hear what I'm saying? We worry about facing uh, different things in life, and God has promised, don't worry about, the, don't worry over uh, so many things. It was Martha and Mary, yet the Lord tells us that all of our worry is, well, I'm going to tell you what it is, is sin. It's sin, sin. Worrying is sinful. Worrying is telling God that I don't trust you. Uh oh, silence. In, and that, and that our our duty is to trust Him, is to trust Him. The bottom line is this: Watch this, watch this. Jesus is all powerful. He is all knowing, and He is all present, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He knows what you are going through. He knows everything there is to know about whatever your circumstances. He already knows. you the one that's sitting around worrying. Why don't you just say, well, God knows. But thank God he gives us emotions. Uh, you know, thank God he gives us emotions. Thank God he gives us emotions. Because if we were emotionless, oh, my goodness, look at the world right now. There is no positive emotion being spread in the United States of America at this at, at this day and time. I don't want to go there. Y'all know I want to go there, but I don't want to go there. America has left God. And they are dealing with their own devices. So that's why I'm saying you and I, we got to come up, the cream of the crop. All of the goodness rises to the top. Am I right? It rises to the top. We can't hang down there with that mess. You got to rise to the top. He even knows more about it than you do. He know about it. He know what you're doing and what you're going to do and what you ain't going to do. Sometimes he challenged you. Didn't Jesus go up there uh, on on that mountain? Didn't the devil tempt him? Didn't he go up there and tell him to jump off the cliff? Didn't he tell him to turn the bread, stones into bread? Didn't he, didn't he tell him to look out and tell him, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this? Well, guess what? America has done just that. Oh, let me say it like this. The world has done just that. Here's what he says to, uh, to you and me. 
the just shall live by faith. Romans one seventeen. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor Jenkins. Is that in the Bible? Uh, uh, when you get a chance, turn to Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Why are you so fearful, the Bible says? Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye. Matthew eight twenty six. What he says to us is that he is the Lord and that he is greater than any problem we have ever or will ever face in life. Well, I don't know. Maybe you're saying that because you, you're at that level. You can handle it. I don't care what level you at. Be it the same level, be it the same level as Paul the Apostle and the disciples when they traveled through this 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 life and they grew and grew and grew and grew. Uh, they didn't dispel the level; they were challenged with it. Jesus was challenged with it. You hear me clearly. Hear me clearly. I said who he was. You don't know. I want to go off on a tangent, preaching on that piece. I'm gonna to have to get back to that. I'm going to have to get back to that. Well, we need to remember that what the Lord has promised to do, he will do. Will you find that, Pastor Jenkins? Romans 4.21. This is the message. Let us take it to heart. Okay. We closed out. I, I, I'm, oh, my goodness. Uh, 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 let me, let me, let me. I got a little bit to do here. So stay with me for just another minute. Uh, Benjamin, if you're listening and I start getting long, I need you to come over here and tap me on my on my shoulder. Praise be to God. What's number two? We need to expect a miracle. We need to expect a miracle. You say, what are you saying, Pastor Jenkins? There was a problem. I mentioned in my introduction the children of Israel were uh, Facing a big problem, the river was over a mile wide, and there were over two million people who had to cross, and yet the Lord wanted them to go over. They couldn't build the bridge. There wasn't enough time for materials. They couldn't transport every old, everybody on boats. They didn't know this was the way this thing was going to go down. There was no boats, and uh, they would uh, they would be like sitting ducks for the enemy on the other side of the Jordan River. There was only one way around their problem, and guess what? That was to go through it. I think somebody got a revelation right there. There's only one way to go through your problem, one way around the problem, and that was to go through it. If you ever sized up your problem and uh, thought about how big it was, maybe you looked at it and and concluded there's no way around this thing, no way, no way, no way around, through, over, uh, past uh, this problem. I suppose we have all been uh, like the ten spies when they said, "Look, there's some giants over there. We can't handle it." Uh, Joshua and Caleb said, "We can handle this." Because they have faith. We have sized up our problem and, and, and think that it's more than we can, can, can handle. Our problem uh, was the same uh, one we always have when uh, we face difficult situations. What is that? What, what is the issue? We forget about God. Where we see the problem, God sees only the solution, sisters and brothers. Where we look at things and say, there's no way God looks at the problem and says, follow me. I have a plan. There was a plan, sisters and brothers. There was a plan. The plan was this. God says, when the feet of the priest enter Jordan, I am going to part the waters and lead you through on dry ground. You say, well, who's the priest? I'm not, you are a priest. The scripture says you are a priest. Priestesses. When you, when you give it to God and your feet touch the problem, God moves in that area. 
there was a catch to this plan, and it was it was that uh, the water would not part un- until you got to that place of priesthood, uh, one with Christ. Who 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 the, the the Levites they were carrying the ark. They stepped in the water. When they stepped in the water, when you step in the water, when you step in the water, when you step in the water, you in the water by God's leading. It'll open up. It'll move. In other words, it it, it took a a step of faith. I said a step of faith whereby the people obediently followed the Lord, obediently followed the Lord for them to see the miracle come to pass. They had to. They had to follow the Lord in order to see, uh, see this thing come to pass. What's that a lesson? That's a, that's a big lesson for you and me. Too often we want the Lord just to fix everything in our lives for us. We don't want to have to make any decisions, nor, nor do we want to have to exercise our faith in him. We just want him uh, to do it, and, and that, that that will be the end of it. Well, sisters and brothers, most of the time God will require, require, will require us to take steps of faith in order that we might see our Jordan pardon. God had a plan. But for this plan to work, it required faith on the part of the people. The same is true for you and me. As long as we are trying to solve our own problems, we are not walking in faith. I told you it's sin, didn't I? It is when we turn loose of the reins of the problem, step away from it, and let the Lord have it, then we will see it taken care of for the glory of God. It never is about what we can do. It is always about what the Lord can do. Amen? I'm going to move quickly. I'm going to move quickly through this thing right here. He told them to consecrate themselves. Consecrate, consecrate, consecrate themselves. Consecrate yourself every morning, every morning. Come on now. Some of y'all done fell away. Some of y'all got ritualistic. Oh, we pray every morning at, 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 at 5 o'clock. And check it out sometime. Every morning at 5 o'clock, it's the same people praying for the same old thing. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Pastor Jenkins. Oh, you said we're not supposed to pray? I'm saying you're supposed to pray. I said the scripture says pray without ceasing. But I'm saying that sometimes even something like that can get ritualistic and there's no consecration. It becomes a, a, a part of the morning coffee. It's what we do for our coffee before we get our coffee. So the ritual of it becomes a place of familiarity. And when we could become so familiar, God said, oh, oh here we go. Uh, he's back with that same old ho-hum prayer. Uh, uh, here she is with that same old ho-hum prayer. Uh, they're praying again. Uh, oh, yeah, we pray for our families. But uh, my goodness, when are you going to accept and receive the fact that uh, under God's provision, under God's umbrella, your family is, is straight in the Lord. He heard you. He heard you the first time. He heard you six months ago when you prayed the same prayer. God know what's going on. You got to know that God know, that you know, that he know. Oh, come on, Jenkins. Stop it. You got Why you had to get rough like that? Well, I'm getting ready to close down. There was a performance. When the priest stepped uh, into the, uh, the, the river, it parted, and God opened a path of dry ground uh, through the waters for his people. By the way, in verse 16, it says that the waters backed up to the city of Adam. You know, she read that. Uh, this is some 20 miles north of where the children of Israel was crossing. That is to say that God already, he, he, was, he was 20 miles away getting ready to prepare a way for this thing to happen. God already knows. He is in the spirit realm handling your stuff right as we speak. Yes, 
There had to be a performance. And we're going to close out here. We need to examine God's message. We need to expect a miracle. And we need to erect a memorial. Are you with me? Stay with me on this last piece right here. Erect an, a, a memorial. When all the people had passed over the Jordan, Joshua commanded one man uh, from each of the 12 tribes to go back and get a rock uh, from the midst of the Jordan and build a memorial in uh, on the side of the Canaan, on Canaan's side of, of the river. Uh, that memorial is worth talking and taking a look at this morning. And some of y'all who were at the uh, St. Barnabas Bethsaida United Methodist Church, if you can remember right there in that foyer, right there where that elevator opens up, right there under that window, we deemed, we as a congregation deemed that we were going to put 12 smooth, not stoned, rocks. We had 12 rocks. I don't know if they're still there. I ain't looked lately. Uh, 12 rocks sitting right under that window up in that foyer. And that was a, a memorial for how God was moving. Uh, uh, he, uh, he brought us through. And if you all remember, uh, when we were in that uh, in that fire, we came back in and we set those rocks there as a memorial for where God had taken us. And sometimes we get so familiar and unfamiliar and leave what God has done and don't look back at the memorial and let the newness come and the new thing uh, come in and snatch what God has done for us. I ain't talking about the church. I'm not talking about the rock sitting up there uh, in the building. I'm talking about you've got to build a memorial in your life so that you do not have to go back and pray the same prayer over and over again. You memorialize that thing. God, now, God, move me on to the next thing you want me to do. Move me on to the next place you want me to be, God. I'm building a memorial. That thing just came to my mind. I wasn't going to go there, but praise be to God. This is what it was, and there was a memorial based on that was years ago. This is all fresh, but that was years ago that that memorial was set up there uh, in that building. Well, you want to know what the purpose of the memorial was? Uh, these verses tell us that the purpose of the memorial was to remind successive generations of the power and faithfulness of God on behalf of his people. Oh, yeah, my voice got a little grouchy there. <laughs> that memorial would be an important landmark to those who would come after them from generation to generation. If he did it before, he'll do it again. We got to set up memorials. We've got to set up markers. By the same token, we need some memorials in our lives as well. However, uh, we must use caution we don't want to embalm. Listen, listen, listen to me here. You don't want to embalm the past and, and by doing that cripple the future either. Hear me clearly. Many churches have done that and are suffering as a result. What we do, uh, want to do, what we want to do, what we do, what we want to do, is remember the things the Lord has done for us so that we can tell others, not sit there talking about, uh, uh, well, yesteryear and yesterday and yesterday, and embalm it and tomb it and then uh, set a little urn up on the mantelpiece and every time you walk by, you, you got to, no, 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 a thousand times no. Never forget what the Lord has done for you in your yesterdays. 
It's those yesterday experiences that will tide you over when the trials of tomorrow and today rise in your life. Come on, stay with me. Stay spiritual with me this morning. What is the picture of the memorial? It's interesting to notice that Joshua uh, constructed two monuments, one on the bank and one in the river on the bank and one in the river. These memorials serve two different purposes. You want to know? I'm going to tell you why. A picture of the faithfulness of God is number one. The one on the bank of the Jordan stood as a testimony to the faithfulness of God. As as I just mentioned, it was there to remind others of what the Lord had done and of what he could do. Again, uh, we, we need to remember the faithfulness of God in the past. It will help us cross the Jordan we face in our lives today and those that are coming tomorrow. I'm feeling real good right now, y'all. It's a picture, uh, number two, it's a picture of the faith of the people. Stay with me. And what about the rock? Uh, uh, about the rock pile in the river? No one could see it, but God. He saw their hearts. Nobody else could see it, but God could see it. God saw their hearts. It was hidden. It stood as a monument to the faith of the people. You see, when you face a time of trial, others are often guilty of misjudging your motives and actions. You hear me? Only God knows the truth about what's going on in you, in your heart, in your head, in your mind. Somebody come up to you, you be hurting, hurting like never before. Hurting, hurting. Oh, child, you need to let that go. I don't know why you still acting like that over that. You build a monument that nobody else can see. You throw your, it's like fasting. The scripture says, when you fast, don't walk around with your hair undone, your eyes with sand in it, your lips with slob on them. Don't, don't, don't go there. What's, what's the matter with you? I'm fasting. <laughs> No, when you fast, you're supposed to do yourself up. You're supposed to take you a shower. You're supposed to put on your glad rags. You're supposed to act like nothing. You're supposed to go ahead on and give God the glory and praise the Lord. This is why they put the monument inside the water. Because only God knew what was going on. Only God knows what's going on in your heart. Some of us, you know, grief is a thing that we're supposed to live with. It's a thing that we're supposed to have. But we're supposed to know that God takes it all and he holds us like a child in his hand. I still grieve for my, my, my mom, Billy, my grandmother. I, love, I still grieve for mom, Billy. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I have a memorial of her. I have a memorial on her, of her because I'm talking about her now. And I have a memorial of her that's in the middle of the river, in the middle of the Jordan, that you can't see and nobody can see, but God knows. But God knows. I'm not going to sulk and, and moan and groan. No, God knows. God knows. God knows. I'm going to push my, I'm going to comb my afro and pat it back now and act like I'm coming out of 1965, yo. <laughs> stop, stop laughing at Jenkins. <laughs> well, we need that same kind of monument that they had. I'm closing out. As I said, too often we are misjudged by others in our times of trial, but God knows, God alone knows your heart. When you trusted him and he has brought you through, never forget it. Build that monument in your heart where only God can see it and where you will never forget it. And when the tough times come again, and it will, and it will, Look at that monument of his faithfulness and of your faith and know that what worked before will work again and again and again and again. 
God will bring you through your Jordans. I'm closing out. Some of you are facing troubled waters this morning. Some of you have monuments on the shore. Some of you have monuments in the water. I want you to know that you have crossed over that Jordan. You are in the promised land right here and right now. I am not going to stop on the on the far side of the Jordan in this message and have a, oh, well, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to make you cross. No, we are crossed. We are cross. And you know why we are cross? Because we acknowledge the cross of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor Jenkins, what's that mean? I'm inviting you to come before the Lord this morning to tell him about the Jordan and how then thank him about your Jordan and thank him for your Jordan. Thank him for your Jordan and how you got over there's a place of victory where you can shout in spite of things going on around. I shout in spite of the political climate. I shout to the Lord, even bombs dropping in Israel. I shout even as God, as God knows what's going on over there. Come on now, if you've read your Bible, you know there are times when God told the Israelites, kill everything that moves, leave nothing standing, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. God is in control. Oh, we have a compassionate heart. Oh, those bombs are falling on innocent people. Oh, yeah, uh, I think God is in control. God is moving like he's always moved through creation. I think I need to leave all that at God's doorstep, not at my doorstep. Because Satan will get in there and mess you up and have you mad at the Hamas and mad at the Jews and mad at this and mad at that and oh the racial climate, and oh, I'm mad. At, uh, I ain't mad at nothing. I glory in God. Come on, y'all. As my sister Betty Rains used to say, come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Well, we're closing out. The first step in getting there is dealing with what's keeping you out. What's keeping you out of your Jordan? Maybe a distraction. Maybe some person. Maybe some trial. Maybe some finances stuff. But let me tell you, God is greater than all of that. Come. Come. Let him take care of it. Let him take care of it for you. You're his child. You ain't his boss. Sometimes we venerate the cross. Watch this. Watch this. Venerate the cross. And hang them everywhere. Hang a cross around our neck. Hang a cross around the windshield of our car. Have a cross with a magnet on the back of the car. It becomes a monument. It becomes a monument. Well, guess what? Let me say that the cross is empty. Whoa, Pastor Jenkins. Let me say that sometimes we venerate the cross and the devil's got us looking at a piece of wood. And I'm saying to you right here, right now, that that cross is empty. Jesus is alive. And he said, what? Remember me. He didn't say, the scripture says, make no graven image. Here goes, here goes controversial Jenkins. Religion. You go to any Jewish, any Messianic Jewish congregation, you will not find a cross. These are Jews that have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they will not by any means hang a cross 
on the wall. It is a symbol. It is a symbol of death and destruction. And people lie right there with the death and the destruction. I'm saying to you, he's alive. We don't venerate the cross. We venerate the life of Jesus Christ. He lives. He lives. Come on now, Sister Elkhorn. Christ Jesus lives today. What? He walks with me and talks with me a long life narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. God bless you and God keep you. God sustain you. He's with you. Inside. And Thank you for listening. Join us next time. And remember to subscribe. Fresh Manna Ministries. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Number 6, verse 24 to 26. God bless you. Have a great day.